Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece. And today we have a review of chapter 962, Daimyo and Vassals. And so, as you can tell by the title, this chapter focuses mainly on how Odin acquired his vassals. And I love that it was pretty much all covered within one single chapter. It was fantastically paced for a flashback, which I often find to be quite slow up until the end of the flashback, where Odin generally speeds through things after the dramatic punch in order to transition back into the modern day more effectively. But this felt like a really meaty yet wonderfully swiftly paced experience right up until the end where we skip forward in time six years. Brilliant, I love it. And it was really cool to see all of these characters that we've known for so long now in their younger days. And here I'm speaking specifically of Kandro and Raizo. It's actually the most maddening thing to think that Kandro was introduced during the Dress Rosa arc in 2013, and ever since then, he's just been a staple within the story, quietly waiting for his own portion to commence. And Raizo is much the same, although he came along, I think, three years later. Along with Kinemon and Momonosuke, these guys have been with us through the large majority of the New World Era, and as much as they may have been background characters for a lot of it, I can't help but feel really satisfied that they are finally getting their deserved attention. What's also quite interesting is that neither Kinemon nor Kandro appear to be fruit users at this stage, which makes me think that we'll get to see how they acquired their powers in this flashback. Like maybe Odin goes out to travel with Whitebeard and Roger, and either finds or is gifted the Devil Fruits, which he gives to his vassals upon his return. Speaking of Whitebeard though, Odin managed to get in a nice one panel reference to the Rocks Pirates, which is always guaranteed to just set the internet on fire. And amongst them, you can clearly see Whitebeard, Charlotte Linlin, Kaido, Shiki, and very, very tantalizingly, there's also a fifth person present. Now, as for who this is, I really don't think there's a whole lot of point in speculating. I mean, people are just going to drop the same names that we already know. It's Silver Axe, or it's Captain John, etc., etc. And at this stage, like I said, I don't think it's worth the time speculating. If Oda wants to show us later on, which he more than likely will, then I'm content with waiting for that. But for now, it's a nice bit of flavor to add to the chapter. However, it does bring up the implications that we are more than likely going to see Odin's journey in the outside world imminently, which is very exciting because that is going to bring with it the chance to explore, at the very least, Whitebeard and Roger, which is always, always, always a much desired opportunity. And in fact, that wasn't the only connection to Whitebeard revealed in the chapter either, because we also get to see a very young Izo who turns out to be the brother of Kiku. And that's a lovely little connection there, but the most intriguing part of it is that to me, it looks like Izo became one of Odin's vassals. However, he is not one of the Scabbards. So I'm very keen to see the situation of how that ended up being. For example, when Odin leaves on his journey, we know that at the very least, Inuarashi and Nekomamushi accompanied him for some time, but with what we know, it would seem like Izo also ventured out, except he chose to stay with Whitebeard rather than moving to Roger as Odin did. And I really love this because it's another moment of classic One Piece brilliance, because while Izo might be a well-known character amongst hardcore fans, he is an exceptionally minor presence to the casual One Piece reader or watcher. But to think that even those small characters have these profound connections in the world is something that no other series can pull off to the degree of One Piece. Also, this whole Izo business, even though we did know he was from Wano, adds a bit more fuel to the idea that the remnants of the Whitebeard Pirates might actually be showing up at some point. And I still cling to this potential idea because Oda has gone to a strange amount of effort to attempt to involve Marco in Wano, only to have him refuse. And now with Izo's direct connection to Odin, I find it incredibly difficult to believe that he would not be willing to return for this battle if he knew about it. And if he was alive, I guess. Because you know, I suppose it's entirely possible that he has been killed by Weevil at this point. But the fact that Nekomamushi still has not made an appearance on Wano is always in the back of my mind. So we may be looking at a situation where Marco gave him Izo's whereabouts or something and his mission became to recruit him back into the fold or something along those lines. I think at this point, it would just be too strange for Izo not to be present given the amount of focus he is receiving in this flashback. As for Nekomamushi and Inuarashi, they were the closing moment of the chapter with the two of them washing up on the shore along with Kawamatsu who discovered them, I might add, which was really cool but kind of unexpected because he wasn't part of the whole collecting allies montage, but it looks like he joins Odin around the same time as the cat and the dog. So cool. I will say that I'm not so sure if this was the strongest possible way to end the chapter. If I could do it differently, I think I would have placed the panel of the Rocks Pirates as the final one. Just because of the dramatic impact of seeing those profound figures. You know, have a narration box explaining that six years had passed, then have the moment of Kawamatsu finding Nekomamushi and Inorashi, and then have that little tidbit about the rocks. Or just end on the rocks and save the Kawamatsu, Inorashi, Nekomamushi stuff for the beginning of next chapter. But then again, what do I know? Oda's been doing this for almost a quarter of a century now, so he probably probably has a better idea of how to make a story flow than I do. But I can't help but feel like this chapter would have had a bit more oomph if the rocks were the very last thing we saw. It doesn't really matter though, because with this ending, the vassals are all gathered. So next week, we'll probably see the small portion of Odin chastising people for being afraid of the minx. But after that, I think we're in pretty full swing. 
and ready for some incredibly crazy stuff. At the moment, being three chapters in, I think that Odin's flashback very much has the potential to be one of the best the series has ever seen, just because Odin spans so much of the series. It's insane to think about, but he may be one of the most important characters to have ever lived, because he has a direct connection to the Pirate King, at least three of the Onko, and his legacy is the reason why the future Pirate King is on Wano right now. And all of this before Toki has even been mentioned, much less made an actual appearance, because that is when things are going to start getting truly crazy with the whole time travel aspect being introduced. But even putting Toki aside for now, Odin is a more than captivating figure to follow, and my favourite part of the chapter was definitely when he was sitting atop Mount Ashura Doji in the aftermath of the Battle of Kuri. He just looks so damn awesome with the arrows sticking out of him and everything. It's kind of like a more effective Boromir. And my second favourite panel was also of Odin, except it was the close-up of his face right before he was about to leap into combat with what seemed like all of Kuri. It's pretty insane how Odin manages to do this, but Odin has that look of demonic determination on his face, which is a familiar sight that we see often in many characters in the series, such as Luffy and Zoro. But whenever that look comes up, it becomes pretty clear that, you know, shit's about to go down. So I love that Odin is capable of conjuring that same sort of terrifying confidence and unapologetic enjoyment about the acts that he is about to commit. And going back to how quickly things were paced, it was also pretty crazy that Odin went from disowned disgrace to beloved daimyo in the space of a single chapter, but hey, it works. Now there was another character who received a bit of intriguing focus this week, and that was Mr. Orochi. It would seem that this chapter has given us a pretty conclusive answer on what I speculated over in the last review, which if you missed it was the idea that Orochi could go one of two ways. Firstly, he could have been an initially good character who was corrupted and went down a dark path, or, and this is the more boring option, that he was already fairly evil and was just using his position within the Kozuki family to his great benefit. And kind of sadly, it would appear to be the second option. So in this chapter, Orochi is obviously responsible for stealing the money from Yasu, and I can't help but be slightly disappointed by this development because I feel like Orochi up until this point has been a bit of a generic scumbag, and I know that Oda can do so much better in terms of character writing. I think I'm just desperately looking for something to redeem his existence, because as it is, I really can't stand the sight of the guy. It's even worse than Spandam actually, because at least Spandam had some solid comic elements, but Orochi is just toxic slime in what seems to pass for some sort of human form. What may become interesting though, is that Yasu has very much clocked the oddity in Orochi's story, and I can see a tragic situation potentially arising, whereby Yasu may have had the chance to stop Orochi before the great invasion of Wano, and for whatever reason, he just didn't or he acted too slowly or whatever. And I suppose what I will say is that all of these chapters are making me appreciate Yasu more and more. It was tricky to comprehend in the modern day as he spent all of his time smiling, but he seems to be an incredibly intelligent individual, and I think it's going to be really fascinating to go back to the early Wano chapters and read Yasu's bits with all of this knowledge of who the character really is. And you know, it's just so weird because when he was first introduced walking alongside Zoro, I was just like, who the hell is this guy? Get out of my manga. And now it's just like a punch in the gut every time he appears because of the knowledge of how his story ends. And by the way, there was also a nice contrast in this flashback because back in chapter 943, there was a brief moment where we saw the scabbards tied up after trying to steal money from Yasu. So this man appears to know a thing or two about money thieves. And finally, as per usual, we move to the cover story. And look, I didn't exactly call it, but I was very much on the right track. Since it was far too early for us to be finding Lola, this, I guess we'll call it a development, was bound to happen. I really enjoyed it though, because I completely forgot all about Kewin, which is the name of the big vacuum lady. She was just such an unnecessary part of Dressrosa. I mean, she was basically created for Frankie and Senor Pink to make a joke. And for that purpose, she got an Oda Box introduction and everything as if she was an important character. In any case, it looks like the Marines had quite a difficult time arresting her, which would make sense because she was a member of Dolphamingo's forces and all, but she would have been on the run for a fair chunk of time now though. I think the best part about this cover is easily Vito's expression and body language though. He has the look of a man who stumbled into a situation that he wants no part of, and he's just gone, nope, and immediately retreated. And I know that he's probably acting this way because the Marines are present, but I love to think that at least part of it stems from the idea that he doesn't want to become a victim of Kewin. But this cover story also did answer my question somewhat about who exactly Beige and his forces would be encountering on Dressrosa, because the timeline of their arrival would seemingly place them there whilst the reverie is still active. So none of the royal family would be there, or Kiros, Leo, Mansherry, etc. But I did forget all about Kewin. Although the only other characters that come to mind that we could stumble across would probably be either Gats, who was the Corridor Coliseum announcer, or maybe even Usi, the fighting bull. Then again, there's probably others I've forgotten about, and if so, I look forward to rediscovering them soon. Whatever the case, I continue to love this cover story.
But that pretty much does it for chapter 962. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produced in general, then please do consider donating to the Grand Line Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this but apply to other anime manga series, then please do check out my second channel New World Review for all of your wider needs. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on the chapter. This has been the Grand Line Review, and I'll see you next time.